Hi all, this is the second lecture about 11.10 Taylor series. So I'm just going to quickly remind you that this is the formula for the Taylor series. f of x equals the sum of the kth derivative of f at a over k factorial times x minus a to the k. Here's what the first few terms look like. And under favorable circumstances, that series converges when it converges to f of x. That's the, the power of it. Um, we went through a couple of examples of finding the Taylor series, or the Maclaurin series, and I'm going to scroll quickly through that and do some more interesting examples, or some different examples. So the first one is find the Maclaurin series for the function x times sine of x squared. So Naturally, the way to start would be to start taking the derivatives of this, plugging in x equals 0, because it's a Maclaurin series, and find the pattern. Okay, That's a lot of work. Instead, we can use the work we've already done. We already know the Maclaurin series for sine of x, and we can use it to find the Maclaurin series for something built out of sine of x. So the... Um, so in general, going forward, you, if you need to find the, the Taylor series of something built in some way out of standard functions, you can start with the Taylor series of the standard functions. So here's the Taylor series for sine of x. Remember, you only get odd powers of x. You divide by the power of x factorial, and then there's an alternating sign. So just like with any power series, you can replace x with any function of x to get a new power series. So sine of x squared's Taylor series is um, the sine of x Taylor series with x squared plugged in where before we had x. So every x Every green x was replaced by a yellow x squared. And then we do a little simplifying. When we looked at x squared to the 2n plus 1, that's a sequence of exponents, so that's the same as x raised to the 4n plus 2. That's sine of x, that's the Taylor series for the sine of x squared. And we know that if you plug a function of x in for x, it will converge in the corresponding Taylor series, it will converge to whatever this converged to applied to x squared. So that is to say, because the Taylor series for sine x converges to sine x, the Taylor series for sine of x squared converges to sine of x squared by the same reasoning. If you um, multiply the Taylor series for sine of x squared by x, then uh, you will get the Taylor series for x sine of x squared. So here we multiply by x, we bring that in, and x to the first times x to the 4n plus 2 becomes x to the 4n plus 3. So that this is the Taylor series for x sine of x squared. First few terms look like x cubed. When n equals 0, we get minus 1 to the 0 over 1 factorial times x to the 4 times 0 plus 3, which is x cubed. When n equals 2, we get positive 1. I'm sorry, we get when n equals 1, sorry, we get negative 1 over 3 factorial, which is 6, times x to the 4 plus 3, which is 7, and so on. Okay, going forward, you want to use the standard series that we know to find series for what you want. So very rarely will you ever need to build a series from scratch. Here's the second kind of out of the ordinary problem. Um, I have a function and all I'm going to tell you is that the kth derivative of the function evaluated at two is equal to this number, right? For each k, this is a different number. So it's a function of k. I want you to find its Taylor series at a equals two and find its radius of convergence. That's a typo. Um, 
So here I didn't tell you a formula for the function. But notice I don't have to. If I told you a formula like x sine of x squared, the first thing you do would be to start taking derivatives of it and plugging in x equals 2. That's already been done for you. So you're basically being, you're given this problem with the first half, the hard half, already done. So take that information and go straight to writing the Taylor series. The Taylor series, centered at 2, is the sum of the kth derivative evaluated to 2 over k factorial times x minus 2 to the k, and we know what this is. fk, the kth derivative, evaluated at 2 as minus 1 to the k times k minus 1 factorial over k. If we take that k and bring it down, and if we take k factorial and use our recursive um, formula for k factorial, it's k times k minus 1 factorial, then these k minus 1 factorials cancel out, these two k's become k squared, and this is our series. The sum of minus 1 to the k over k squared, x minus 2 to the k. I also asked you to find the radius of convergence. That's old hat. You do the ratio test. The limit as k goes to infinity, absolute values. On the bottom, we put the terms of the series, minus 1 to the k, x minus 2 to the k over k squared. On the top, we put the exact same expression with k replaced by k plus 1. Then we flip the denominator over so that k squared goes on top, the k plus 1 squared goes on the bottom. We um, group terms together, so k squared gets mapped with its little friend k plus 1 squared, x minus 2 to the k plus 1 goes with its buddy x minus 2 to the k, and we bring those absolute values in, minus 1 to the k, an absolute value is 1 to the k, which is just 1. So these guys just went away, and the absolute values stick when they try to go inside x minus 2, because x could be positive, bigger or less than 2. So this first term simplifies to absolute value of x minus 2, and the second term becomes, as k goes to infinity, k squared over k squared, which is 1, so the whole thing becomes absolute x minus 2 is less than 1. That's a radius of convergence of 1. Um, so that may, that's all I asked you for. But of course, that means that the interval of convergence goes from a minus r to a plus r, from 1 to 3. And had I asked you for the um, interval of convergence, you would then have to plug in the endpoints um, the endpoints are 1 and 3, but you know how to do that. When you plug in 1 or 3, you're just going to get either 1 over k squared or minus 1 to the k over k squared. That's what the endpoints always look like. It throws away all the exponentials. They look exactly the same with all the polynomial part, except 1 is minus 1 to the k times the other. And 1 over k squared is P series with P equals 2 converges absolutely, so that means both endpoints converge absolutely. The interval is 1 to 2, inclusive. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of feel of the kind of problems you're going to be dealing with for um, Taylor's theorem, Taylor's series, but now I want to move on to Taylor's inequality. Um, so I want to remind you that if you have any old infinite series, sum k equals 0 to infinity of a sub k, we say the nth partial sum is the sum from k equals 0 to n. So that's a finite sum, right? That's just a1 plus a2 plus a n, whatever a n is. That's a finite sum that is part of the infinite sum, throwing away everything after the a n. And when we say that this infinite series converges to a number L, what we really mean is that the sequence of partial sums converges to L, uh, which really means that when n is very large, the error 
between the approximation Sn and the limit L is small. What does that say about Taylor series? So in Taylor series, um, here's the infinite series. Here's what we're hoping it approximates. The nth partial sum, so that should say nth, is just the series truncated at n. Okay, so S sub 2 is f of a plus f prime of a x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 x minus a squared. That's one example. Any, any number you put below s gives you just a polynomial. So that polynomial, Sn, is called the Taylor polynomial of order n, or the degree n Taylor polynomial. n refers, a little typo there, to the highest power of x minus a that you keep. Okay, so just a little side note, when we said e to the x is equal to x to the k over k factorial, then S4 would be just plug in k equals 0 through 4 and stop. 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6 plus x to the 4th over 24 and stop. Okay, we hope that that's a good approximation to x at least near to 0. So the error that we want to estimate is the difference between f of x and s sub n, which is the difference between f of x and that finite polynomial. We want that quantity to be small, um, and Taylor's inequality is going to tell us how small it is. <clears throat> so a little word of notation. When we're talking about Taylor's inequality, we've got a which is where the point, where the series is centered, and then we've got some point x. And, but we're also going to have to talk about all the points in between. Okay, We're going to ask something about the function, how the function behaves all the way from a to x. So that could either be in the interval a comma x, if a is less than x, or the interval x comma a if x is less than a. Um, there's no nice way to talk about that, so I'll just say the words. We're to kind of, we want to talk about all the numbers y between a and x, and y will be our name for, those, for that other point or those other points that fall between x and a. Okay. So <clears throat> you pick a number n, and then what you have to compute is the biggest that the absolute value of the n plus first derivative of f gets on all the points y between x and a. Okay, So when you were writing Taylor's in a, when you were writing Taylor's series, you had to figure out what every nth derivative of f was at a. So here, the extra thing is you got to figure out what the n plus first derivative of f is at every point between a and x, and then you take the biggest that absolute value gets. Okay, You should recognize this expression as the kind of thing that showed up when we were estimating the error for trapezoid rule, midpoint rule, or Simpson's rule. We always took the biggest that the second or fourth derivative of f could be in the interval of integration. So here, it's the biggest in the interval between a and x. Okay, Then the error of Sn. So Sn is the nth, the polynomial, Taylor polynomial of order n. The error is bounded by this formula. That formula may look a little intimidating, but notice Sn is going to be um, the sum of all the terms f k of a over k factorial up to of x minus a to the k. And the last term that you will keep in your uh, Taylor polynomial is the nth term. 
So the first term you throw away will be the n plus first term. Sorry, this was n. That was very confusing. Not the kind of mistake I'm used to making. Um, OK, so here's the last term in our series. Here's the first term that you dropped. Taylor's inequality bounds the error by almost that first term. So the only cost is, instead of the first term, you replace the n plus first derivative at a with m, which is the biggest the n plus first derivative can be between a and x. Okay? So it's very close to being the next term, or the absolute value of the next term. Okay. I'm going to show you uh, next time. I am going to show you examples of how to use this. It's a little bit involved because we are going to both um, we use this to see that the Taylor series does in fact converge to the function. We can also use it to estimate the error um, to see how rapidly it converges, and that's a little bit of an involved process. So. That is going to be our third Taylor series.